This is the Recruit the Employer podcast, and you're listening to episode 98, Five Secrets of C-Suite Female Leaders. Welcome to the Recruit the Employer podcast, a show for the ambitious, action-oriented career woman who wants to live out her purpose, rise to the top of her industry, and be seen as a leader at work. In 30 minutes or less, we'll walk you through the latest strategies to land your dream job, blast through imposter syndrome, and make the money you deserve. I'm your host, Jenna Viviano, ex-Wall Streeter turned career coach and founder of Recruit the Employer. But more importantly, I'm on a mission to help you fall in love with your work again. So grab a glass of wine, get ready to be coached, and tune in to your weekly boost of career confidence. Hello, friends, and welcome back to Recruit the Employer. Today's conversation is with my friend, Lara Weldy. She is just an amazing leadership coach for women who are in corporate, who are looking, maybe perhaps young managers, all the way up to senior executive leaders, who are looking to take ownership of their careers and really understand what it takes to be that successful leader and rise to the top of the industry. So this is just a really fun conversation with a friend of mine, a fellow coach. I know you guys are absolutely going to love it. This is just a reminder that we have another Network to Hire workshop coming up. So for those of you that don't know, you can check out more information at recruittheemployer.com slash workshop, where we are going to have a five-day workshop. We've done this before twice. Um, So we're going to be having another one at the beginning of April. Um, So it's just right around the corner. To sign up, again, go to www.recruittheemployer.com slash workshop. And over those five days, we're going to walk you through, actually take a piece out of the Recruit the Employer program and teach you how to network so that you land the interview and start growing your um, networking skills over the course of your career, not just when you need something, not just when you need a job. So this is really, really helpful for my um, six-figure earners. We really try to keep it for a six-figure earner so that you can um, kind of connect with one another, um, learn a little bit more about each other's careers, and then also get this information that's going to be really relevant to your career. So um, again, recruittheemployer.com slash workshop to check that workshop out. Again, it's beginning of April. We're going to be launching that. But without further ado, here is my conversation with Laura. Okay, Laura, are you back in Nashville? I'm back in Nashville and I missed it so much. (laughs) How long were you gone for this summer? And like during the year, I feel like a while, right? Yeah, I was gone for almost three months and it was not intentional to be gone that long. (laughs) Was it like COVID related? Do you feel like? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I went back to visit, um, my folks and my new baby niece was coming and I wanted to meet her, but obviously in order to do it like COVID safe, I had to have enough time built in at the beginning and end so I could quarantine from my family and get tested and everything. So yeah, it was a lot of alone time in my parents' basement, but totally (laughs) worth it. (laughs) That's so funny. My sister's actually doing that right now. My my mom's making her like quarantine. We have a lake house that's near our house and she's making her quarantine by herself in like little bumble F nowhere, basically. And she is just like, she's tired of it. She's like, okay, I need to, I need to not do this anymore. (laughs) Yeah. It's rough, but honestly, it's so worth it when you get to see your family safely. Yeah. So we were talking about 2020. I've been asking people this question when I'm either interviewing them on LinkedIn live, but, or, you know, for a podcast episode, Mm -hmm. 2020 was a year to say the least. (laughs) Um, so what do you feel like though? We can like comment on all like the bad things about 2020. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's also a lot of really good learnings from it as well. So what would you Mm -hmm. say like a great way to start us off before we hop into explaining what you do and all that fun stuff, but what would you say your number one takeaway was from 2020? Yeah, I, so many. I mean, if you read back through my journals from last year, you will learn so many things about my (laughs) internal workings, not all of which is flattering, but I will say that the things that I'm taking away from the last, you know, couple of months, especially Mm -hmm. is that seeing possibility in what's happening around us will save us every time. And Mm. I think for me, that was especially crucial. You know, I have dealt with anxiety in the past. I've dealt with depression and dealing with the circumstantial situations that made all of that worse this past year, Mm -hmm. being able to steer myself from, you know, 
seeing the problems first to seeing the possibilities is really what kept me going um, and kept me inspired and kept me showing up and loving my people. So just being willing to see possibility in even kind of dark times. Yeah. And I so relate to that because I probably honestly lean the opposite side where I lean more Mm -hmm. like, let's see the possibility. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it was shocking that when there were moments this year where I was like, Oh, this is the worst. (laughs) Cause I don't lean that way. I definitely lean on like, there's so many Mm -hmm. opportunity. Yay. It's so exciting, you know? And Mm -hmm. I know not everybody feels that way. So I love that you were able to kind of switch, switch that for yourself. That didn't feel maybe as natural because of past experiences with anxiety and all that kind of stuff. So, well, and I feel like we met each other at such a weird time because I (laughs) have been historically known as a very optimistic person. Like my child. Childhood yeah. nickname was Smiley. I was oh always gosh, looking so <laughs> for fun and possibility and optimism. And um, just in the last few years, yeah, that's been kind of a challenge. So I think we're all coming out of 2020 having learned a lot about ourselves and hopefully yeah. more resilient than we ever were. Yeah. So you mentioned a little bit about like the past couple of years. So share with mm-hmm. our audience kind of what you do a little bit about who you are. Yeah. So I am a women's leadership development coach. And what that I love. Me, <laughs> thank you. What that means for me is just, you know, I've been a intersectional feminist my entire life. I've always had a heart for helping women get the things that they want, despite the challenges that modern society sets up for us kind of uniquely. And this past year, I've just been more invigorated around it than ever because we are seeing or have seen so many women leave the workforce, leave careers because of the pandemic. And we we need to be really proactive about developing women from the get-go in the workforce if we truly want to kind of even the playing field when it comes to representation and contribution and career. And the reason, you know, Jenna, that you and I both, I think, focus on career. I don't want to speak for you, but I I have a hint here (laughs) that we may be on the same page is because career is so much a part of our life, right? So when we learn to love our career, we find ways to love our life even more. And we can't just ignore those 40 plus hours a week that we're working and build our dream life in our off time. So much of it starts with how we show up in the workplace. So That is what I do, just helping women get confident, empowered, and take ownership over their career path. Being able to declare, you know, who they want to be as a leader in and out of office. Yeah, I think that's so important. And I always I talk a lot about ownership too, because Mm -hmm. I honestly think this is men and women struggle with, quite frankly. I don't think it's just Mm -hmm. women. And I've worked with plenty of women in my past or men in my past, but the idea of like owning your career, because we're set up on this, like very structured trajectory, right? We're like elementary school. Then we go to, you know, preschool, elementary school, Mm -hmm. middle school, high school. Okay. You go to college and then it's like, what's next? And we kind of like Mm -hmm. lose that ownership almost because we don't have a clear path because no one gave it to us. So we have to kind of navigate that alone and it can feel really overwhelming. And that's when you start getting the imposter syndrome, the, you know, deflating of the confidence, all those things that you were talking about. So Mm -hmm. I love that you, specifically help women, um, uncover that confidence and take ownership of their career. Cause I'm with that, except specifically around job transition. <laughs> so exactly. we talk specifically about how do you own your career with like, what's that next move, but you didn't always do this though. What were you doing beforehand before you got into coaching? Yeah. And I mean, just really quickly to wrap up that thought for you, I feel like it's because until we reach like quote, full adulthood, whatever that is, Mm -hmm. we are being trained to be consumers and not creators, right? Mm. So that's that big shift that Mm -hmm. so many of us have to make when we start owning our career is recognizing like, oh, okay, we've done excellently following the rules our entire life, but there are no more rules because this is kind of where we have the wild, wild west. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I, I agree with everything you said. So yeah, I didn't always do this. I've been doing coaching full-time for about four and a half years now. I love coaching women, but a lot of that love of coaching women and specifically this idea of leadership came out of my history. You know, I graduated college and I went immediately into the world of nonprofit, which Mm -hmm. I loved. I was very much a mission-driven person and super high achieving, very motivated, And inevitably that led to my burnout and Mm -hmm. having experienced career burnout at such an early age, 
And then repeating it over and over again (laughs) in the next couple of careers that I pursued. That's what made me realize, okay, this can't be me. Like this is not a me problem. This is a structural problem. How do I deal with the fact that I'm being set up to burn out in every career that I enter? And then how do I take ownership for the ways that I'm kind of being complicit in that? Which mm-hmm. led me to, oh, okay. I well, can help other if, people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can help other people do exactly the same and just stop burning out. Yeah, I think burnout is something that, uh, quite frankly, it's like everybody's experiencing that to some degree mm-hmm. right now. I think we're too connected personally. I have a mm-hmm. lot of opinions about social media. I have a lot of opinions mm-hmm. about us knowing everything that's going on in the world 24 seven. I don't think it's healthy for us. And so all of that contributes to burnout in all areas of our life, specifically in our career. Cause we're always connected and we don't get a break. We're like, think yeah. about it 50 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, this wasn't a thing, right? We didn't yeah. have our devices connected to us 24 seven. So that alone, let alone all the other pieces to the puzzle can cause us to be burnt out if we don't create proper boundaries. And part of that results back to confidence too. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, the fact that women have a tendency to get burnt out at higher rates than men Mm. adds to this problem of less representation of women in leadership. Mm. And I think you're right. I think burnout is, there are two main factors that drive burnout, right? There's too much of some stuff and not enough of others. Yeah. So there's too much information, accessibility, too much time, quote, on the clock, even if you're off the clock. And then there's not enough boundaries. <laughs> there's not enough yeah. healthy coping mechanisms. There's not enough modeling of really healthy work behavior going on, which is what leads to that to that yeah. issue. And you can't be confident and burnt out at the same time. Yeah, or it doesn't work. If you can, you're a miracle worker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know for myself, that's definitely, definitely not been true. <laughs> are working with women at that senior level, or I guess trends that you've seen, or once you've worked with somebody, what are some of those things? Like what sets those type of women apart? Because we get a lot of women that are listening to this and you maybe have a dream, maybe you're, maybe you're early in your career, you're mid in your career, and you really do have goals to be in the C-suite to not get burnt out. What would you Mm -hmm. say to those women? Like what sets those women that get to the top apart from those that don't? Yeah. I'm glad you brought this up because I work with two different kinds of women in my coaching. Mm -hmm. I work with women one-on-one who are already in their kind of coveted dream roles that could be C-suite or director, whatever they may be working on. And then I work with women who are on the brink of that. So I like lovingly Mm -hmm. call them my pre-suite women. And I just want to remind- I love that. (laughs) Pre-suite, so good. Yeah, I just want to remind people like the magic in every company is in the pre-suite. That is where our people Mm -hmm. are who are not being tapped- for their input and for their skill set. And so much of executive coaching, which is really, you know, C suite exclusive, mm-hmm. is just about retention and pulling people through that, that burnout cycle and holding on to them. Whereas leadership coaching that focuses on the pre suite is about helping those rim- women build sustainable career success and sustainable habits before they hit the C suite. So, yeah, we work with both. But all of that to say, yeah, I have kind of these five characteristics that I feel my healthy C-suite women show up with in the world every day that really sets them apart. Let's, so, let's hear them. I'm here for it. Let's do <laughs> I'm it. Take Get out your myself. pen and paper. Yeah. <laughs> I do tell people on this podcast, I always say, as long as you're not driving, you're probably going to need a pen and paper because I try mm-hmm. to make it as practical as possible. So I love that you're bringing to the table five things. Let's go. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. So number one, strong sense of self. Mm. They are not the women that are waiting to be defined by everybody around them. Um, They are telling their own story, right? How does that play out typically? Yeah. Typically that means understanding your personal values, your professional values, and how loyal you are to those values, right? So Mm. I think this comes down to, okay, I know that I value empathy. I know that I value honesty. And I also know that I value transparent communication. Mm -hmm. These three things come together in relationship to how I communicate with my team, how I communicate with myself, how I communicate with stakeholders or clientele outside of the office, and just really being in alignment and integrity with those values at all times. Mm -hmm. I love that. I also see that whenever people are transitioning, like if Mm -hmm. people that have a strong sense of self have a much easier time in the job search process, like emotionally, Mm -hmm. um, and actually like results wise, because if they if they don't have a strong sense of self, then they won't negotiate, then they won't actually 
you know, put themselves into positions or try for positions that maybe are a little bit ahead of them because they're like, well, I don't know if I can do it. And that's the first yeah. thought instead of the second, instead of the second thought, <laughs> you know, well, we all have yeah. that doubt that's normal. And I have doubt too, but I want to always be the person that leads with, of course I can. And then like, okay, well, maybe I need to adjust, but the first thought that always be <laughs> right. Like, of course I can. Why could I yeah. not, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, you bring up a good point. The the job search, job transition search is such a overwhelming process for so many people that if you add to that, I'm looking for who I am at the same time that I'm looking mm-hmm. for a new job, you are not going to have a pleasant experience. <laughs> yes. Well, I think that's a lot of people right now, right? And that's exactly. why I think having coaching to support you in that people don't realize they think they should just be able to know how to do that coming out of college. Mm-hmm. Like no one taught, no one in college taught you these things. I'm sorry. Nine times out of 10 colleges do not teach their students all of these principles that actually make a difference when you mm-hmm. get into the workplace. That's a whole nother tangent I could get on about secondary education, but <laughs> totally. <laughs> The no, first I get one it. Is, is strong sense of self. What's the second one? Yes. The second one is a willingness to take responsibility. And I do not think that this has to mean just like being responsible for your habits or like keeping mm-hmm. your house clean or whatever else we think of when we think of responsibility. It's a willingness to own things in the workplace and a willingness to be held accountable for the results that you're creating. Mm. So many people that I talk to that want to be seen as a leader hesitate to kind of stick their neck out in a meeting or offer to take on a project or offer to mentor a new person because they're afraid that the results will reflect poorly on them in the end. Mm. And yeah, I see that a lot. Is, <laughs> yeah, I and see what that, that a lot. means is they're just not doing anything to set themselves apart. Right. Yeah. So I see that with people all the time. And even in like, we just did a networking, um, workshop network to hire. Mm-hmm. And we, a lot of questions were like, well, I don't want to reach out because like, what if they, what if it totally ruins my chances? I'm like, what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> no. mm-hmm. Why is that the automatic thought? We had to take some responsibility and then take action for that. Yes. And we need to reframe responsibility, right? It's Mm -hmm. not, you're not taking on everybody else's success when you take responsibility for a project. Mm -hmm. What you are taking on is you're making a pledge that you're going to do your best with all available resources Mm -hmm. and that you are going to stand by that until the project is complete, right? We need to stop making responsibility and success and metrics mean anything about us. (laughs) That's part of why we're hesitant to take them on. Yeah, that's good. I love that one. Cool. Okay. So number three, they have a vision for their legacy as a leader. Mm -hmm. So I've talked to women, you know, every single day for four and a half years about this question of (laughs) what is the legacy you're going to leave in the workplace? How do you want other people to feel about you as a leader? And at first it can feel like kind of a self-centered question, but it's really a service oriented question, Mm -hmm. right? If you think back to your favorite job, I would say like eight out of 10 times, your favorite job was your favorite job because of a favorite manager. 120%. Yes. And the, so, and the opposite is true too. Like people leave mm-hmm. their jobs, they come to me. It's nine times out of 10, not because they don't like their function. It's because they don't like their team or their boss. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So when you're thinking about your legacy, I, you don't have to have this desire to be seen as like, you know, an altruistic humanistic figure that impacts everybody around the world. But you do have to have a vision for how you want your people to feel and the kind of experience that they're going to have with you as their leader. Mm, I like that, that more localized viewpoint Mm -hmm. of it. Cause I feel like we do, since we do live in such a global world, we see what's going on on a global scale all the time. We sometimes forget about the people Mm -hmm. that are right around us. And so we're like, we got to go for, sometimes we get so overwhelmed by the big dreams of like, I have to be a, as you said, like this moral leader on all the different things to be known around the world. When really it's like, actually you just need to be known in your community for your people Mm -hmm. that you're leading right now. Mm -hmm. Takes the pressure off. Yeah. And I can't tell you how often women who are in that, you know, pre-suite stage tell me, well, I don't have a vision for my legacy yet, but I don't need that yet. Like I'll figure it out when I get there. Mm. No. And then, and then that doesn't happen. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) You have to be proactive in it. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't have a vision that excites you about how you're going to impact the people around you as a leader, then Mm -hmm. chasing that leadership role isn't going to be important to you and you're not going to end up there. So decide your vision now. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Hi there, friends. Jenna here again. 
Let me guess. If you're listening to this podcast, you're probably not looking for any job. You're looking for the right job. And the right job is not at your current company. You're tired of feeling underpaid, overworked, and like your career is in the hands of the employer. You're ready to make some moves, but you're overwhelmed by all of the options. Don't know how to sell yourself and have a nagging feeling that your lack of confidence is keeping you from success, not to mention negotiating the amount you're worth. If this sounds like you and you're a mid to senior level career woman who makes over $100,000, we have the five-step solution just for you. Our signature program, Recruit the Employer, is designed to help women leaders get clarity on what they want to do, market to their dream jobs, and negotiate thousands more. Using a personal branded approach, we equip you with the tools to sell yourself in a non-sleazy way, think like a C-suite leader, and ultimately take back control of your career. To apply, head on over to recruittheemployer.com slash call. Over the course of six months, you'll network with other female leaders at similar stages, learn how to double your salary and solidify your career story. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention that dreaded resume and LinkedIn profile. Yeah, we do that for you. Because of the intimate nature of this program and limited spots, we're really very selective about who we invite into the program. To see if you'd be a good fit, again, head on over to recruittheemployer.com slash call to apply today. What's the next one? The next one is, I'm sorry if you can hear my dog in the background. This is like <laughs> quarantine life reality. It's so. real life, real reality. It's fun. It is what it is. <laughs> okay. So the next one is self-management. So when I work with women one-on-one around leadership, the very first thing we do is figure out how are you leading yourself? And is it in integrity with what you want to do to lead other people? So if you are showing up to your desk every day, annoyed, frustrated, in a bad headspace, doing the bare minimum to get by, not taking care of yourself, not prioritizing the things that you know you need to or want to. All right. We got to get you in line first. <laughs> right. And no, I think that's so important because it's kind of like this projection reflection idea. We talk about this a lot. Like if you're projecting out something you're going to receive that in return. So like mm-hmm. if you are projecting out all of those things that you don't really love on team members, it's going to happen with your team because you have to lead by example. I love that. Yes. And you're, yeah, the power of modeling is so yeah. important more so than the words you say, it's how you're showing up. Other mm-hmm. people will do the same. So mm-hmm. yeah, self-management is key. And then the last secret that I have for you of women who are in this C-suite is this desire. I think this is a mindset conversation, the desire to learn over the desire to constantly prove their authority. Mm. Wait, repeat that again. That's so good. Desire to learn over the desire to constantly prove their authority. Gosh, that's, can you explain how that plays out? Absolutely. So what I see with a lot of new leaders is they become so obsessed with holding so tightly to this label of leader, to authority, to coming off as strong, that they kind of close off themselves to learning and being supported by their team. And that doesn't create the best results for the business, whatever your business is. So the illusion of authority is that you get the title and with that you're bestowed some like superhero level kind of power overnight (laughs) right and we feel like we have to change everything about ourselves we have to wear three-piece suits we have to talk differently we have to you know limit accessibility to ourselves and instead if we're given the gift of authority then we need to stay open-handed with it. So instead of clutching it too close to us, we need to be willing to ask other people what they would do in our situation, to ask for the expertise that we've created in the people around us, to be willing to try new things and potentially fail (laughs) over, you know, picking our own system and only working within that and shutting down other voices. Yeah. I think that's really crucial. It's almost, when you say prove their own authority, I almost think of like Mm -hmm. overcompensation because of insecurity. And I see this also a lot with young leaders where there's insecurity that happens there. And so self-awareness is so important in this leadership journey. I just did, I just actually wrote a course for another organization. And I literally talked about this exact same thing because you see it happen all the time. Whereas young leaders, of course, we're learning, we're growing, but we have to be receptive 
to the mm-hmm. learning and to the growing and not just try to prove, oh, we deserve to be here because that's what your time's going to be spent doing and not really actually cultivating a team and growing those leadership skills. Yeah. And people are smart and they see it, right? Yeah. <laughs> they we know see when it. You're we've we've had those bad it. bosses. We've know what that's like because we've experienced, we've been on the other side, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love that. So those are the five secrets, a strong sense of self, willingness to take responsibility, vision for legacy, self-management, mm-hmm. desire to learn over proving authority. I love yes. those different things. So I think Thank this you. all kind of like drives back to, if I were to kind of put it and use this term a lot, confidence, like how does this mm-hmm. reflect and how can women actually increase their confidence work? We talked about these things that people at C-suite level have, but how can just mm-hmm. like the average everyday girl, woman mm-hmm. going into the workplace, how can she increase her confidence at work? Mm-hmm. First of all, I just have to say, like, don't let somebody tell you that confidence is a soft skill. You know that I get on my soapbox about this, Jenna, but like the label is walk soft me, skill. Walk me through that. Cause I actually love yeah. the term soft skill, but you, you have said you find it insulting. So like walk me through so that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but not, I mean, not that I think you're trying to be insulting. I find the label of soft skill as insulting yeah. because I think that we equate hard skills with masculinity, soft skills with femininity. Mm. And I think that it implies a hierarchy of one is better than the other. And that's not not true. I think, yeah, yeah, I think all of them are necessary. We say people use the term soft skill usually when they're trying to like dismiss something (laughs) as Mm. less important than the hard skill. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally makes sense. Yeah. So I tell people like, Instead of soft skills, I think we need to frame it as like, what's like a better way to frame this? Like maybe there's expertise instead of hard skills. And then instead of soft skills, it is people development or people-centric yeah. skills because both of these things matter. Um, but yes, how do we help women increase their confidence at work and reclaim confidence as an essential skill versus a quote soft skill? And I think the first way they do that is they decide that they're going to become confident at work, right? I know that's a decision. No, but it's such a decision. It totally is a decision. You have to decide, am I going to be confident? At some point there is like a Mm -hmm. a pivot point. You can either stay stuck where you've been, or you can decide, no, I actually deserve to be in the room. And because I was asked here, I'm going to own that one Mm -hmm. or two. um, I'm going to be confident enough to just apply for the job because what's the worst that can happen? Like that's a decision Mm -hmm. point. It's an action take. It's not a feeling held. Yeah. It's stop Googling or Pinterest searching how to appear confident at work (laughs) and decide that you are freaking confident at work from this point forward. And it's hard to make that shift on your own. And this is exactly why I created the Confident Leader Collective, which is a program that we're launching right now. It's a community for women that are relatively new to the world of leadership to find community with one another, with Mm -hmm. other people that are striving to embody that confidence Mm -hmm. and do it together. So it's like a a safe space to practice it all, right? To practice what it means to own a project, to practice what it means to declare your boundaries and actually hold them up, um, to practice what it means to get okay with confrontation, to practice communication, and to do that with other people that are going to give you honest feedback, yes, but who are on that journey with you and they're outside of your workplace. So they're not competition to you in any way whatsoever. Because I think that we we truly build our own confidence by helping the people around us build theirs at the same time. Mm, that's good. That's good. Mm-hmm. And I, I definitely relate to that. I think even and this is a testament, honestly, to my parents, where I feel like they instilled that in me as a young girl, where like, I really didn't realize that there was sexism in the workplace until I got to the real world and people told me about mm-hmm. it because I personally didn't, I wasn't looking for it necessarily. I obviously knew it was happening. Mm-hmm. It happened to me. There's some instances, but like, I feel like it becomes, you have to, you have to embody it kind of like what you said, because otherwise mm-hmm. circumstantially, just going back to what we were talking about earlier, circumstantially, it's going to show you the opposite. <laughs> So that you shouldn't be confident. So you, it really has to be an internal thing that happens within you that you decide like, no, I deserve to be in the room. No, I deserve Mm -hmm. to have boundaries. No, this is, you know, I want to develop my, I am a leader right now, even if I'm Mm -hmm. still growing in that. So I love what you're saying there. I love that. Yeah. I'm good enough as I am. Right. I think it's, it's not, what are you doing to be confident at work? It's who are Mm -hmm. you being? Mm -hmm. That's the coaching question we ask you know, over and over and over again, who am I actually showing up as? And how do I show up as more of that woman for sure? 
I love that. And then, so we're talking about some ways that women, you know, the number one, just decide you're going to be confident. Mm -hmm. (laughs) People are probably like, oh my gosh, give me a five-step plan already. Right. Um, (laughs) But like, what do you feel like women do get wrong at work? So we talked about some things that they get right. We've given the five secrets. What do you feel like women get wrong when it comes to the workplace? I think women spend more time looking up than around. And I think this is a detriment. I think we need strong peer support more Mm. than we need a mentorship. And the reason that I'm not like a huge fan of mentoring relationships is because they tend to be one-sided, right? They're like Mm. us admiring somebody and that person may have a genuine heart to help us, but they just typically don't have that much availability or investment in our career. And we can't ask more of them. (laughs) You sure. So asking around you, looking around you, pairing up with peers, with coaches, people who can be super hyper-focused on your work, I think is more valuable than, you know, setting up a admiration ship altar to some figure who's like a girl boss that you admire. Right. Yeah. And I think that also just the waiting, waiting for permission, waiting for somebody to notice you, waiting for somebody to offer you a promotion. You have to ask for the thing that you want. You have to model how you want to be And then you have to ask for the thing and you may have to ask a lot of times, but waiting is, is what's going to kill your career. Yeah. I think that's true. Even when I think about women with negotiating, that's obviously a whole other separate conversation, but Mm -hmm. um, a lot of women that have been in my program have never negotiated or negotiated very little. And Mm -hmm. after going through the program have negotiated $30,000 for it. I mean, that's, that's, that's like a whole salary for some people. (laughs) Yeah, it is. And so, I mean, I think even what you're talking about there, the waiting for, they were waiting for permission to be given the salary when really they needed to ask for it because it's going to help them throughout their entire career. So even negotiating Absolutely. for a lot of you that are listening, you're probably thinking about switching jobs. This is, this, this is still very true for people who are looking to transition and don't wait for permission to ask for the salary that you believe that is market rate and that you deserve based off your experience. Yeah. I mean, I, wish that I had your course on asking for more (laughs) when I was earlier in my career. Cause I, you know, I've learned so much of what I've learned from the women that I coach, but also from my own experience, Mm -hmm. I used to work in a role and I didn't find out until years later that I was getting paid significantly less than my Mm -hmm. peer. Um, the only difference being that this person was a man and I just Mm -hmm. never asked for more because I never asked what he was earning. I never, asked. I just waited figuring I would be rewarded. So yeah, it's, it's crucial. Yeah. The waiting part, that's what a woman get wrong at work. And I, I see that 100% of the time. So Mm -hmm. what advice would you have for those women who are like, okay, I hear those five secrets. I want to rise to the top of my company or my industry. What advice do you have for those women? Mm -hmm. My advice is bet on yourself first. Mm -hmm. Right. If you want to rise to the top of your company, decide you're going to rise to the top of the company and then put all of your effort and investment behind making that happen. Because when you declare that that's what's going to happen, other people are going to see you doing the work and then that's where the magic starts to develop. So start developing the skill sets that you're afraid you don't have. Start creating your vision of your legacy. Start showing up at work every day as who you imagine you're going to be in five years. Right. Yeah. So stop playing this like catch up game or fix it game of, oh, well, I'm not ready for leadership because X, Y, Z and start showing up as the person who is. Yeah, that's good. Mm-hmm. That's really good. We actually do that in recruit the employer in our program. The first module is, is outlining what a successful career woman looks like to you. And every mm-hmm. single woman's vision looks different, which is beautiful. And I love that there's not like one set in stone way to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that you absolutely nailed it right there when saying like, start taking action and bet on yourself first, that investing in in yourself, investing in yourself beyond what your company, um, allows you to. So like investing Mm -hmm. in someone like you, I think women in nine to five don't really understand the value of, of leadership coaching as often because Mm -hmm. it's been given to them. But at the end of the day, like you really want a third party that's going to be able to dialogue with you about the politics. It's going to be able to help you with develop the skills that maybe your company doesn't allow you to, or doesn't have programming for. We can't Mm -hmm. expect our companies just to provide us with all the resources that we need to get our job done. We also, I think, need to step up to the plate as women 
and invest in ourselves because it's going to have a, a compounding effect on us over the long term in our career, not only for our happiness and monetarily, but also just being able to be seen as a woman leader at the top. If we're able to kind of develop yeah. those skills early on. Yeah, that is like one of the mindset shifts that I want nine to five women to take from the world of entrepreneurship. Is yeah, we talk about this all the time. <laughs> every investment as what is the ROI here, right? Yeah. And it's true. It's not, I think sometimes about like gifts, a gift that I'm given from somebody, however well-intentioned, do I value you, value it and appreciate it and use it as often as the thing that I've invested in myself? Typically mm. not. Mm-hmm. And so the same thing comes true when it comes to investments you're making in your career. If you're waiting until your company provides you with leadership coaching or career transition coaching or whatever it is that you're looking for, they're in control of that situation still. And mm-hmm. you don't feel that same sense of ownership over your path and over your development. Yeah. And also, yeah, they're not objective if they're provided by your company, right? So right. being able to bring in these outside voices whose number one concern is like you creating the success that you want versus right. you fulfilling your current job role. It's it's going to be so much more supportive. Yeah. And I think the phrase, I don't know who's coined this first, but um, so if somebody knows, you can tell me, we'll, we'll credit to them. <laughs> but um, those who pay, pay attention. And I think that's 100% yeah. true. Like the women that have been through my program, they've gotten like a 3X turn, return on investment. They've mm-hmm. got a 5X return on investment, literally from a monetary standpoint. And that's just immediate. When people are investing in like things like leadership coaching, which feel like maybe, oh, there's not a tangible, like I can't like at the end of this, there may not be some specific tangible thing, but the the lifetime value of that, of you be feeling more confident is going to have a ripple effect in all areas of your life. Um, If you guys are listening to this podcast, a couple episodes back, we had one with Sarah where she talked about how she didn't realize how not confident she was. And when she got finally was able to understand the value that she was able to bring to the table through coaching she mm-hmm. was able to actually turn down a job where she was making more money because she realized it wasn't in line with her legacy that she was trying to create. She launched her own business and has really been going after it. So I think that mm-hmm. people need to look at return on investment in so many different ways that we're just maybe not used to in the nine to five space, which is why I love, love, love what you do because you're really impacting women, not just in their present day situation, but over the long term as well, which I think is so important. Mm-hmm. So yeah. where can, where can people find you? You've been so helpful in giving us some really like key secrets of these C-suite level women and what women need to be looking mm-hmm. out for. You know, if somebody wants to decide like, you know what, I need to take action and I need to invest mm-hmm. in my career. I'm in a spot right now in a position that I want to grow within. Where can they find you? Yeah. So they can find me on Instagram at Laura Weldy and just send me a DM. That's like the easiest way to connect with me, honestly, in this super connected world. Yeah. <laughs> um, they can also find me at laurawelly.com and learn more there about Confident Leader Collective, which we have open enrollment for right now. So Amazing. if they are a first or second time manager, then that is the ideal program for them. Um, and if they are more of the C-suite woman, then reach out to me about a custom coaching plan that's going to help support them in the next three to five years. So that's awesome. the best way to find me. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. And friends, we will see you next week on the Recruit the Employer podcast. Thanks for having me, Jenna. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Recruit the Employer podcast. If you've been loving this podcast and it's been helping you approach your career in a brand new way, I have two shameless asks. Number one, make sure you hit subscribe right this very second. That way you won't miss a single episode. And number two, would you give us a review? Reviews help other ambitious career women like you know that this podcast is the place to be and helps the podcast climb to the top of the charts. Think of it as some good career karma. And as always, if you want to learn more about the topics we discussed today or are ready to take massive action and invest in yourself and your career, we would be honored to help you. Head on over to recruittheemployer.com slash call to book your free strategy session. Regardless, we will see you next week.